it is nice to be able to meet together, isn't it? And have a lot more people uh, being able to fit in. Always good to have the human contact, isn't it? There's, and uh, come back to church, um, to come back as Jenny and I feel if it's, it's safe enough to go to the supermarket, it's safe enough to come to church. Man shall not live by bread alone. Shall we pray together? Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for the power of your spirit that speaks through your word. And that spirit who inspired the holy prophets and apostles of old and who caused us to be born again through his power. May he now speak into our hearts and minds and souls to bring your word, your living word, into our hearts. Give our minds clarity, our hearts love, and our wills determination and strength to be obedient to your holy word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, many years ago, I engaged in a pastoral practice that today may see me find $10,000 or get 10 years in jail. A deeply distressed young man, unknown to me, came to talk over his problems. One of his worries that he might be homosexual. He recoiled at the idea, so asked me to pray for him not to be so. Offering that pastoral prayer in my study may soon become illegal in Victoria if harm would later be proven. The Victorian government now considers it has the moral and the spiritual authority to declare what prayers are acceptable and legal by pastors and priests. Yet euthanasia is now legal. Uh, think of the absurdity. In Victoria, a person with an unwanted terminal illness can freely ask a doctor to kill him, and the doctor can legally do so. But if a person with an unwanted homosexual feelings freely asks a pastor to pray for him to change, the pastor may face criminal charges. The doctor may legally kill, the pastor cannot legally pray. But a state believes it has the moral and the spiritual power to decide which prayers God may answer, if and when and how. The assault on Christian practice continues. You may not know that as of the last month, uh, the Netherlands government allowed euthanasia for those between the ages of two and 12, adding to one-year-olds there is now no age limit on euthanasia. How can a two-year-old give their own informed consent? So it is now legally permitted for parents to kill their own sick children in certain circumstances. It will be extremely rare, but that is hardly the point. An adult, an adult not of sound mind may also request it and have their wish granted. Now, I raise these matters to illustrate how far the West has drifted from its Christian basis. We live in a fool's paradise if we think there is no political power or no political powers that want to silence God's truth, God's word and God's church. We only need to look at the New Testament to see that, and that's what we're going to do now. There are three named martyrs in the New Testament. First is Stephen, Acts 6 to 7. We know him well. The second is James, Acts 12. Third is Antipas, Revelation 13. Both are usually overlooked. But the reality of anti-Christian hostility permeates almost the entire New Testament as it does in our world today. There are about 250 million Christians currently being discriminated against, persecuted, vilified, killed, or otherwise experiencing hostility, usually from the state. And such hostility is irrational. It should not surprise us that Satan himself is wholly bereft of truth and thus has no rational thought himself. 
I spoke on the first Christian martyr, Stephen, this time last year, so today I'll concentrate on James, Antipas and the church's witness. After all, yesterday was St Stephen's Day, which remembers Stephen's martyrdom. So first, James in Acts chapter 12. The James we are concerned with was one of the first disciples, Acts chapter 12, 1 to 2. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Now, when James first heard Jesus call on the shores of Galilee, he probably had no idea that it would all end in his decapitation. Others were also arrested, yet only James felt the cold steel of Herod's sword across the back of his neck, most likely because he was an original disciple and a leader. When Herod discovered that killing James pleased the most hostile opponents of the early church, the Jewish leaders, he widened his program and arrested Peter, who, like Jesus, was arrested during the Passover period. The reason for Herod's actions is clear. Kings, presidents, prime ministers, all like popularity. Plenty of thumbs up likes on Herod's Facebook page for killing James. <laughs> Yet James' beheading is passed over without much more than a wink. The story concentrates on the earnest prayer meeting for Peter when he was incarcerated and his subsequent miraculous deliverance. We hear nothing more of James in Acts. The focus is on the spread of the gospel. And then there's Antipas, Revelation chapter 2, verse 13. He belonged, Antipas belonged to the third of the seven churches addressed in Revelation, the church at Pergamum. Revelation 2, verse 13 reads this, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Pergamum was famous for its imperial cult, the cult that worshipped the emperor as God, a fitting reason to call the city the place where Satan lives and is enthroned falsely. Now, Antipas is the only martyr named in Revelation, even though there are many references to others who have been or will be killed for their faith in Christ, we know that the author John himself was in political exile for his faith. That is why at the beginning, John describes himself as their companion in the suffering and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus Christ. Patient endurance recurs frequently in this book, patient endurance. Patient endurance is required of all those who live for Christ in hostile environments. Not retaliation, not violence, not insurrection, not killing, not assassination, patient endurance. Well, what have James and Antipas got to do with the church's witness? Well, the answer is simple, isn't it? The word witness or testimony are both English translations of the Greek word marturion, from which we get the English word martyr. A martyr witnesses to, points to a truth or person other than themselves, a person or truth for which they will lay down their lives. The church as witness is thus the church as martyr. Last year, on July the 8th, the then British Foreign Minister, Jeremy Hunt, presented a report he had commissioned to the persecution of Christians. Let me read the first few paragraphs of his speech at the launch of the report. Good morning, ladies, gentlemen. Welcome to the Foreign Office. When I was moving house last year, I came across a book called God's Smuggler, which I first read when I was about 10. At the height of the Cold War, Brother Andrew Vanderbilt would smuggle Bibles across the Iron Curtain to communist countries where Christianity was ruthlessly suppressed. When the Berlin Wall fell 30 years ago, the European nations that Brother Andrew had visited undercover won their liberty and achieved one of the greatest advances of human freedom in modern history. 
Yet when I became foreign secretary, I learned that almost a quarter of a billion Christians are still enduring persecution around the world. The evidence shows sadly that the situation is becoming worse. The number of countries where Christians suffer because of their faith rose from 128 in 2015 to 144 a year later. In the Middle East, the very survival of Christianity as a living religion is in doubt. A century ago, 20% of the region's peoples were Christians. Today, the figure is below 5%. Now, just let that sink in. In 2016, four years ago, 144 out of about 200 nations in the world were persecuting Christians. It's almost 75% of the countries in the world. This outlines massive contemporary attacks upon the people of God. You see, the Herods of this world have never gone away and they will never go away. The attacks on the church are brought about by many pathological human reasons, but as the book of Revelation reveals, are always inspired by the prince of darkness. His clever trickery will deceive even God's elect if we allow him to do so. So the question must be asked, why is it that no one seems to care? As I emailed the ABC this month, why do you, who so proudly boast about holding truth to power, not cover this appalling situation? One USA black man killed by police gets blanket media coverage and the police officer is held responsible and charged with murder. Yet 250 million Christians are systematically persecuted, like the Pakistani Christian girl recently murdered by a boy for refusing to convert to Islam to marry him, and the press is silent. Now, why? Perhaps this is the silence of complicity by the Western media, which, like so many key Western institutions, has become deeply anti-Christian. And their silence has emboldened the opponents of Christ. One million Muslims in West Chinese re-education camps get media coverage, rightly, yet the persecution of 250 million Christians is ignored. Now, why? Now, it's easy to ask this question, but it's harder for us to act. Perhaps our emotional lives, you see, are shaped more by this wretched media that we have, in so many ways so focused on certain things, other than scripture. Why do we feel most, what do we feel most passionate about? Unfortunately, it's what we see on TV. What bothers us the most? What can we do? Our mind should be shaped by the word of God here. We can pray and we can get connected with organisations that are involved in the helping of these people, the persecuted church, like the Barnabas Fund or Open Doors. But how can Christians in difficult situations, avoid hostility and criticism. Like, how can we avoid hostility and criticism? One answer is to stop being the witnessing church and become the cowardly and compliant church. This is what has recently been coined the echo chamber of Christianity, a church that is no more than an echo echo chamber of the wider culture, bouncing back its own ideas and values in order to gain social peace and approval and to secure a seat at the table of social respectability. Now, it reminds me the great Victorian English Baptist preacher, Charles Spurgeon, who castigated his own people with his biting wit when there was an aping of Anglicanism going on in the Baptists in the late 1800s. And he said, what have Baptists been doing recently except trying to be fine? That is respectable in the eyes of the establishment. Friends, Baptists are dissenters. We dissented from the conservative Church of England establishment in the 1600s for the gospel's sake. And we should be prepared, be prepared to dissent again when compliance with today's progressive establishment requires sacrificing the gospel, its doctrines, and especially its ethics. 
Proverbs 29, 25 says, fear of man will be a snare, but those who trust in the Lord will be kept safe. Proverbs, the book of Proverbs is about prudence, about wise prudential living. And it tells us it is not wise to go quiet out of fear. It is cowardice and it will prove to be a snare and trap us up. But let me go back to Revelation, the book where Antipas is mentioned, what we might call the New Testament's Book of Martyrs, for it was written to the churches of southwest Turkey, suffering Roman imperial persecution. It describes both opposition to God and God's victory over his enemies, doesn't it, in grotesque and violent, weird imagery. And near the end, we read about the New Jerusalem, Beautiful imagery here, but there's also some grotesque imagery beside it. The New Jerusalem, we read about those who will enter it and those shut out from it and cast into the lake of fire. And who goes into that lake? Revelation 21 verse 8 tells us. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, idol worshippers, and all liars. Which one, if any, shock you? What about the cowardly? The cowardly are the first on the list passed into the lake of fire. Now, the cowardly are not those who are afraid of bungee jumping or open heart surgery or whatever. They are those who are too cowardly to stand for Christ, who refuse Christ, who cave in, who become a mere echo chamber of the Roman state and its demands to worship the emperor and the culture and the ways of life around it rather than Christ. They are jelly-backed. They comply with unbelief. They are unlike Stephen, the first martyr, or like James or like Antipas. The cowardly are those who are ashamed of being part of the church, witnessing to the risen Christ and his lordship. You see, they fear COVID-19, but fear not God or his judgment. They do not trust and obey Jesus Christ because the cost is too great. They are cowardly. They are cowardly and they do not believe because of fear. If they do not believe, of course they will not enter God's eternal kingdom. But we can learn about witness and costly witness from two more people, can't we? Both died for obeying God's call. First is uh, John the Baptist. <clears throat> you may recall that in John chapter 1, he is baptising his fellow Jews for repentance and coming in preparation for the coming Messiah. And this is how the story unfolds. Christ enters the scene. John sees Jesus. And when he sees Jesus, he points to him and makes that greatest of all public declarations which anyone should be able to make. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What a wonderful statement. John then goes on to speak about the Spirit coming upon Christ and this little part of the story is introduced by the word John gave this witness. And this little part of the story concludes in his own words, I have seen and witness this is the son of God. Then the very next day he again declares, look, the lamb of God. And the whole episode is introduced in the gospel the previous day with the simple words, this is John's witness. When the Jews sent priests and Levites to ask him, who he was. See, John pointed to Christ. As Paul later writes in 2 Corinthians, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ, <clears throat> Jesus, and him crucified. The church's witness does not stop talking about Christ, not in some insipid fashion, but the Jesus Christ who is so important and so significant and so true and so mighty that he is worth dying for. 
I've recently been impressed again by some of the extraordinary achievements of those explorers and pioneers of the 1800s. You ever read any of those stories, the pioneering British and Europeans? One of them comes to mind. I forget his name. He was the British founder of the South American Anglican Missionary Organisation. As a boy, he wanted to be a seafarer and a sailor to prepare himself and toughen up he would sleep on the wooden floorboards of his home when he was 12. Think of the hardships these explorers put up with. Friends, compared to them, our generation is made up of mere pygmies, aren't we? Risk averse to the point of neurosis, we are afraid of anything that might cause us harm and discomfort. Friends, living for Christ will make you safe eternally that may well make us unsafe here and now. Think of John's final days. King Herod had married his sister-in-law while his own brother, her divorced husband, husband was still alive, contrary to Jewish law. John rebuked him, so Herod cut his head off, setting a precedent for another Herod to behead James later. Why was John imprisoned and beheaded? What was the issue involved? Sex and marriage. Ring a bell today? Witness can be costly, ask footballers. But the greatest of all witnesses who was killed for his obedience to God was, of course, Jesus Christ himself. Revelation again. Chapters 1, 4 and 5. The greeting, John wishes his readers grace and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, God the Father, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Christ is the faithful witness. His life was a witness to God's truth. When he declared himself to be the light of the world in John 8, he was criticised for being merely self-testifying. His reply, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony or my witness is valid and true. When challenged about whether his words were trustworthy, he declares that they are. But even more than that, he has other witnesses who point to him, his works, John the Baptist, his heavenly father, the Old Testament, and Moses. Other witnesses pointed to him, but he is the ultimate witness to God. Jesus is the faithful witness. He is the one whose words and works and life and death witness to God. He died as a faithful witness, as did John the Baptist, Stephen, James and Antipas. But of course, he is more than all of them. It is wrong to simply consider Jesus a martyr. He was not. He was and is forever the incarnate son of God who died as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He did not die for some noble cause. He died for us, fulfilling his father's plan for our eternal salvation. Most of us are quite familiar, aren't we, with the great list of heroes of faith of Hebrews chapter 11, the great list of the faithful. But the chapter ends with two abbreviated and unnamed lists, conquerors and martyrs. The conquerors administered justice, shut the mouth of lions and quenched the fury of flames, Daniel, escaped the edge of the sword, they escaped, had their weaknesses turned to strength, they routed foreign armies, they received back their dead. Sounds great. The martyrs were tortured jeered and flogged, chained and imprisoned, stoned, probably Stephen, thorn in two, put to death by the sword, likely James, wandered around in animal skins, were destitute, persecuted, ill-treated. They wandered in deserts, mountains and caves. They lived in holes in the ground. Not great. But you see, such people are the great ones. For verse 38 says that the world was not worthy of them. 
Isn't that incredible? The world was not worthy of these people. It was just not good enough for them. They were so great. They were so great. The world wasn't worthy of them. They weren't some sort of chocolate soldiers melting under fire. And so chapter 12 begins, since we are surrounded with such a great cloud of witnesses, these great ones of chapter 11, run with perseverance the race set out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Now we should never yield to the world's name calling and insults and emotional manipulation when it entices us to get with its ungodly program. In the words of Hebrews 12, 12, Strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. If we are humiliated for following Christ, Peter says, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Jesus said, blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness. Jesus himself was shamed, not in the sense of being cowering, but exposed to public humiliation. When he was crucified outside the city walls, the place where the sacrificial animal's offal was cast and burned. And there may well be times when we have to, as Hebrews 13, 13 says, go to him outside the camp bearing the disgrace he bore. Let me say that there is a huge freedom. There is an incredible freedom of heart and spirit and soul when we come to the point when we simply do not care what insults may be cast at us, what people may think of us for faithfully following Christ when it just doesn't matter to us. And we gladly bear that name. And they can say what they want. And we just don't care what insults they throw. We are beyond it. What freedom of heart and soul we have when we faithfully follow Christ and it just bounces off. It just doesn't matter because of Christ. The church as witness is a church that will bear the cost so we need to make our knees and arms strong. Knees to run the race and arms to fight the enemy. So first was Stephen, then James, and finally Antipas. Perhaps we could add John the Baptist as well, but no echo chambers of the world, no chocolate soldiers and no jelly backs there, were there? See, the faithful... Church is the witnessing church, and the witnessing church is often the martyr church. So let's strengthen our feeble arms and our weak knees. For here we have no enduring city. We are looking for a city that is to come, the new Jerusalem, which is uninhabited by the cowardly, but filled with the faithful who honour Christ as Lord. Let's pray and ask God that we would have strong arms and strong knees for the fight. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, uh, for for the life story, for the lives we see, the faithfulness of people like James and Antipas, those who would, who just refuse to be coward before the world and its demands for them to comply, to bow down and agree with its ungodliness. Thank you, Lord, that these people set us a wonderful example of strength, character and faith. Pray that you would help us, that you you would help us to strengthen our feeble arms and our weak knees, that we would run the race with perseverance we would be strong, we'd look to Christ and that we would be glad when we are persecuted for that holy name of Christ. We pray for our brothers and sisters around the world, the quarter billion of them currently persecuted for righteousness' sake, that, Lord, you would stay the hand 
the violent hand of the evil, and that you would deliver them, and that you would strengthen them, and that may they live as faithful followers of Christ, no matter what the cost. And Lord, touch our hearts as well, that we may not only sympathise, but pray and stand with them. We offer our prayer and seek your blessing and your power through your spirit. In Christ's name, amen.